Jesus, Jardin de mon oncle, which actually is a nonsense sentence, but I can still remember it. And, um, and because I did really well at it, I am proud of myself. I did really well. I was 13. I had never studied a language before, but I did really well. And so we took an exam at the age of 14 and a half, and I passed very well. And so with the sheer intelligence and wisdom of a 14 and a half year old, I said, right, I've got the exam, and I gave it up. I stopped studying it, which is so stupid, because obviously it could have been something that would have changed the path of my life. Anyway, that's what I did. And I stopped it completely. And then two years later or so, I went to France to work on the Vendange, uh, the grape harvest. And the first week, I couldn't say anything. And the second week, I was fluent. Because something had happened. I mean, yeah, estoy exagerando un poco. But I, mean, I was pretty good. I was speaking French. Uh, and why? Well, grammar translation seemed to suit me. But it sure didn't suit the rest of the class. Or rather, it sure didn't suit a lot of the rest of the class. And one of the criticisms of a method like grammar translation is exactly like that. It may suit you, but it doesn't necessarily suit him. A method doesn't necessarily suit everybody. Um, oh, and then the, my next language that came along was this one. And, and why? Well, because at the age of 23, I came to Mexico. To, to work, I came to Mexico to teach English. Uh, and I didn't have any, any Spanish at all. Uh, my girlfriend at the time uh, was bilingual, so um, anything we had to do, she did. And so for a few months, I was just kind of, uh, 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 just, you, you, you feel so stupid, you know, because you can't. And, and then, of course, you, uh, you've got two alternatives. One is to stay in your ghetto and never learn Spanish, because that's fine. I can, I, can, I can spend all my time with other English teachers and things like that. But the other is you need to go to the mercado and buy something. You have to say what you want to buy. I had a car. You take it to the taller. And how do you explain, how do you explain, what's that? How do you explain the wing? There's a dent in the wing. It's impossible until you learn it. I haven't taken a car to the taller for a long time in Spanish. I think a wing is a salpicadera. Is that right? Is that, is that the correct word? No, you see there, no, that's very, that's very Chilango. Um, um, there you are. That's, that's what it is. Anyway, so I got Spanish. My Spanish is not perfect, by the way, uh, but it's fluent. I'm perfectly happy. Well, I'm not happy with it. I'd like it to be better, but I don't live here anymore. And I, I don't study it. And that. Um, there's another language I, I want to, which has taught me something, and that's this language. Uh, my wife is Brazilian. She comes from the northeast of Brazil, and her family are all Brazilian from the northeast of Brazil. What language do they speak? Portuguese. So I need to be able to speak to them. But I haven't learned Portuguese. Why? I don't. I just can't explain it. I've got some psychological problem. Uh, me and my wife have never spoken to each other in Portuguese. She speaks, she's like you, she's a, she, she speaks English as well as you guys. She's bilingual, she's an English teacher, uh, uh, works in the field of English language teaching. We've only ever spoken to each other in English. And what I should do is I should, I should go and study Portuguese and get it. Did you know, by the way, that Spanish people find it much more difficult to learn, Spanish-speaking people, find it a lot more difficult to speak Portuguese than Portuguese find it to speak Spanish. Do you know, did you know that? So if you're in Brazil, for example, and you speak Spanish, they don't understand everything you say, but they sort of get it. And then when they speak Portuguese to you, oh dear, you don't get it. So, so then we, you sort of speak Portunhol. I've had many taxi rides in Brazil where we speak about football in Portugal. And since I don't know anything about football, I spend a lot of time going, ah, see, 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 can't you see? Um, and they seem very happy. That's all right. Uh, one other story, one other story. Uh, I want to tell you about uh, Tanya. Tanya's my daughter, my eldest daughter. And at the age of four and a half, she was bilingual. As far as I could see, completely bilingual. She was, all of her friends, all of her friends at the kinder in Guadalajara, they, were all, they all spoke Spanish, so Tanya spoke Spanish. 
perfectly good Spanish. She was, you know, yes, and her, her accent was entirely, uh, <coughs> it was just a classic Tapatio accent. And, and you know, she's just a, a little Mexican kid, um, sort of. And then we went back to England, went, and her younger sister, uh, I suppose was bilingual, but she only had about four words, so, um, so it didn't count. And then we went back to England to live. And then we thought, my wife and I, my first wife and I, we thought, this is silly. Um, what we're going to do is, from midday every day, we'll, we'll be in Spanish all the time. So we tried it. And my little daughter got furious. I mean, I've never seen her so angry. Why are you speaking like that? Stop speaking like that. So we'd say, oiga, pero tú, tú hablas español. Todos tus amigos en el quinto, ¿no te acuerdas ese día cuando... Cuando tú te encargaste de, 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 ¿cómo se dice? Raise la bandera and all this kind of thing. Stop that. Stop speaking like that. Stop it. Uh, and she aggressively, aggressively lost all her Spanish. I mean, it, it, she, she did it on purpose. Now, I've, since then, I understand what was going on. Uh, all around her, nobody spoke Spanish. Uh, and also, um, what we know about bilingualism is there has to be a pattern of bilingualism. One parent, you speak to your kid in Spanish, your husband, your partner speaks to your kid in Japanese because he's Japanese, she's Japanese. So the kid, if that's a regular pattern, the kid will get Spanish and Japanese. But if you then try and impose it, at the age of about four and a half, they just, they just know the world's gone wrong. Um, as it happens at the age of um, 18, he uh, decided uh, to go and work as a, vo a volunteer in the Universidad de Colima because she, by this, by that age, she wanted, she she had her heart wanted uh, the Mexico she'd been born and grew up in. Of course, now she speaks perfect uh, Spanish. Perfect, no, but she speaks perfectly good Spanish. Her accent is better than mine uh, for some reason, um, and she gives public lectures in places like Chile about. South American history in Spanish. Wow, I'm impressed. What's the point of me telling you this? Oh, by the way, quickly, before I go on, and I'm spending far too much time on this, would you like to just turn to the person next to you and tell them your language story? What languages do you have? How do you get them? Go on, quickly, quickly. Just have it. Just see if you all do. You all have the same story. What's your story? You got to find someone. <laughs> Can you can you help? Will you help this lady? She's looking a bit a little, a little isolada here. So can you? Help? Um, what's your story? What's your story? Why? Did, how many languages? Do you speak? I'm only English, Spanish, and I'm trying a little bit of Italian, but How's I'm just starting. And why do you speak English? What's your story about? English? Well, I started using it because it was necessary for my career, and I discovered that I liked it. Yeah, it was a liking for it. Pushed yes. Pushed it forward. Yes, I like it. What about you? Well, I, it's, it's kind of similar story. I started uh, teaching English, and I kept with it, and I love English. That's why I started teaching English. Fantastic. Are you learning Italian or anything like no, that? No, yes. A little bit of French. Good luck, good luck. Um, so, everyone has a language story. Everyone has a languages story. And it's really interesting with students sometimes, with our students, to get them to do what you just did. Maybe they all have the same story. Maybe they all say, well, of course I speak Spanish. And I, 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 the reason I speak some English is because we did English at school. And, and things that someone just said to me there, and I discovered I love, I liked it, so I wanted to learn more of it. Array result. That's a good result. The point of all of this long, long introduction is to say, language is wonderful, fantastic, a bit enigmatic. I don't quite understand how it works, and none of us do. We sort of do, but we sort of don't. Everyone can do it, but not everybody does. But the real point is that the ones who can do it don't necessarily get there. They don't necessarily get there in the same way. 
We get there in different ways. And maybe your impulso, your motivacion, what do you call it? Maybe you get the ganas <laughs> uh, to do it for different reasons. So the question then is, what conclusions do I draw from all this? Conclusion number one, um, uh, wanting a language, needing a language, or being in the right place, they're real key components for learning. So I, re I, I, I feel ashamed because my Spanish is not as good as it should be, but, but of course I speak Spanish because I needed it and I was in the right place at the right time. Everyone around me was speaking Spanish unless they were in English classes. So, you know, I can't take much credit for that. And if we can make students want it or need it or get them into the right place, even in just a classroom, we've won. Um, it seems to me all the stories I told you about kids who want to play computer games or kids who want to read about fashion or something like that. It's them who did it. They're the ones who had the idea in their heads. They had agency. They took the decision to learn a language. Now, if you're listening to this, if you're a science teacher maybe or something, um, they're really successful scientists to people who say, I like this and I'm going to take control of learning this. I want this. So that's, that's the first key. Second, uh, that, that, that's the second key about agency and social engagement. Number three, um, one of the reasons uh, um, that, that uh, some of the people who've told me that they learn English uh, because they wanted to play computer games, for, for example, um, they had agency. They did it themselves and they learned how to process what they were learning. Uh, Jaime was telling me this morning about how he actually, on his own as a kid, translated from English into Spanish and back again with, 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 with lyrics uh, and, and with computer game stuff. That's agency. That's wanting to do it himself, taking control. Uh, and, and, um, but of course, the one thing we have learned, and the reason I told you my story, which isn't terribly interesting, and it's certainly not unique, uh, and, and as I say, I don't take any credit from it, is because guess what? One size doesn't fit all. We don't get success in the same way. Different people get to it in different places. No, that was a terribly bad sentence. Different people get to different places on different routes. Is that better? I think that works. Okay, how are we getting on? I think we're doing all right. I hope it's okay in the back there. You are you all right? Give us a give us a yes, good. Um, so, do you know, those guys, they need a clap, don't they? I mean, interpreting, give them a clap. They're fantastic. I, uh, I, I just, I'm in, I'm in a, listen, I was, I, we were talking before. I had such a, a nice conversation with those guys. And I was telling them, I'm, there was once a, a, an artist I know in England who speaks English, no Spanish, and there's a Mexican artist came and they wanted to collaborate. And so they asked me if I could um, uh, help them out. It's bloody difficult. It's really difficult. I mean, I could, I could explain what each of them wanted to say, but it was <laughs> really hurt. Anyway, enough of that. Let's see if we can work out. I'm going to use some sort of teaching materials to see if we can try and match these four things in some way or other. So here we go. This is all about uh, um, I, I want my students to want something or need something or I want to get them into the right place where they will just do it, and it's around them. So here's some, here's some I'm going to show you some pictures. Now that's all, I'm going to show you some pictures. Here we go, first one. Second one. They all come, by the way, from a unit from a course book. A course book. Here's the third one. Here's the fourth one. Now, I hope, I hope, I desperately hope that you're interested to know what that's all about. Just a little bit. Please say you are. Please. 
you know, because otherwise it's a long way away from, from, from England to here. And it'd be terrible if you said we're not very interested. Because, you know, what, that was the point. Anyway, so, yeah, okay, let's just go, um, let's go back and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something about them. But, but my point is, with any luck, by the time you start reading about this or listening about this or working on this, you are interested enough. You'd like to know what's going on. That's the idea. What's this all about? And it's about art. Of course it's about art. But what, do you, what, am, what am I going to tell you about? For example, that's a bit of art. What's special about that? Well, as it happens, um, and this is what you'll find out, my dear students, <coughs> in English, because it's in texts or stories, as it happens, that's um, in a place called uh, Albra in England, in the east of England, on the coast. And it's a, it's a piece of art as a memorial to a famous British musician. Uh, and the problem about it was that people in the village, some of them hated it, and they tried to destroy it and take it down. And there was a whole big, big kind of bataille about it, and they, they sprayed graffiti on it, and they, they did everything, and they said, this is the most disgusting piece of art. Other people said, we really love it. It's fantastic. I, I love it too. I think it's amazing. It's, it's fantastic. Wow. And that's quite a story, the power of art to really make people go crazy for or against. And, and uh, artists will tell you that if your art does not provoke that kind of conversation, there's no point in it. Because that's one of arts. Oh, well, that's for later. Hold on. Um, uh, what's this one? Oh, this is a piece of, of, of art by a, a Thai uh, uh, sculptress, and she's called it... Um, She's called it Girl Losing Her Memory. Girl Losing Her Memory. And I look at it, it fascinates me because I'm not quite sure how to interpret that piece of art with that title. Uh, what's this, this one? Uh, oh yes, this is, this is a picture of an, an art exhibition by someone called Nordstrom. A Canadian artist. She's a believer in invisible art. In other words, the art is invisible, but as you look at it, not there, what happens inside your head is a huge kind of artistic process. And there was a radio program. National Canadian Broadcasting got really excited about this, and people got very angry and said, that's not art. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. That's pathetic. Art has to be something. It has to show something. Why does it have to show something? Invisible art really matters. That's how I get into your brain with invisible art. And what, may, what I love about this story, especially, is there is no such person. And it was a hoax. And it was a hoax, a, a kind of hoax, where people were making fun of art and what people say about art. She doesn't exist. And here's a picture which I took. It's a photograph I took in Central Park in New York a few years ago, an Italian artist, and this aeroplane just keeps going round and round and round and round and round. And it, you, what, you look at it and you say, that's an aeroplane going round and round and round. But the point about art is it gets quite spooky. Or something begins to happen, you begin to see things in it, you begin to, etc., etc. Now, the point about all this, you were going to listen to and read about these things, my dear students. And my hope is that those pictures gave you a little bit of desire to know what was going on. <coughs> Here's another thing where I want you to need English. I want you to need English. I'm going to put you in groups of five. I'm not, because the, you, there are other things to do today. If I put you in groups of five and we do the work, it'll take hours. Uh, <coughs> but imagine I put you in groups of five and I say, in 15 minutes, you have to present to the class uh, your understanding of the, the role of art in society. In Durango, does art have any role in the society? Or is it just something that artists do? <coughs> What's it for? Why do you have sculptures in public places? Why is the I, haven't, I must go and have a look. There's a whole sort of sculpture outside there, isn't there? Uh, 
What's that about? Does that have a role? What's the point of it? <coughs> and I want you, in your groups of five, to plan what you want to say. And then you're going to present to the rest of the class. And you, every single person has to take part. And if the group is going to get a grade, it will be the same grade for everybody, but you will get marked down if one person does all the work. And guess what? You need English. You need to work in English. You need to go get it. You need to find it. You need it. You really need it. And that's, I'm trying to replicate what happened to me in this country. <coughs> Here's another one. Uh, my friend uh, Jane Ravel, who's, who's a writer, talks about everybody up. She says, pair work's fine, but actually it's much better when you get people talking in little groups, discussing. But actually if you do that when you're all see, see, sitting down, it's kind of meh. What you do is you get students up into groups in the middle of the classroom, standing and talking. And you find out if anyone has a poster in their room, what pictures they like. Some, here's some things to talk about. Does anyone here draw? Do you ever draw pictures? Do you have you ever taken a, a photograph? <coughs> of a work of art, et cetera, et cetera. And that conversation, in order to take part, you need English. You want English. You want to use it. And when you want to use it, then you're mine. I've got you. Because that's what I want. Uh, um, I, I like that. Um, but also, that has, a, that has one of the things that helps people learn languages, which help me learn Spanish. Más o menos. Una vez es menos que más, pero bueno. Um, but, but, but what helped me, I didn't do it in a book. I did it in social context with people, longing to get to a stage where we could chat about something in your life, you and me discussing in Spanish, because that, that's, and, and actually, when we did, you probably spoke Spanish to try and help me understand, and that was part of the process. Like mothers and, and babies talk to each other. It's a social process. It's not just baby hears language, speaks language. It's a social process. The whole business of the personal interaction between the baby and the mother or the father uh, uh, working together, so on and so forth. Right, so there's that. Uh, what about the social and personal? Oh, I'd love some. Oh, you are a superstar. Yeah, well, you are anyway, but you're, uh, you wouldn't mind opening it, got my hand. Um, the, the next, uh, I want to talk about um, the, the sort of this social and personal agency. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, some speakers um, get water when they're speaking, and they have the microphone close to their mouth. And you, it's, it's not a nice noise. Okay. Here's a, just very quickly to the person next to you, the person next to you, um, and you're going to have to turn around again, because otherwise you're going to have to talk to the chair, um, and you'd say, she needs somebody, she's uh, alone. Um, question, question, uh, do you find it easy or difficult to learn languages? Why? Just talk to the person next. Do you find it easy or difficult? Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now, so now, if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, I've got your social and, and sort of personal 
engagement and interest in the topic because I didn't say read the text. I said talk about yourself. Talk about yourselves. This is about you. I want you to be the center of what's going on. So you talked about learning languages, difficult or easy. And now we're in that zone. And now I say, okay, thanks very much. Now read this text. Now, you can't read that text. Obviously, I know you can't read that text. But it's a text about, uh, and it's called The Enigma of Language, and it's a text about three people, uh, two from the 19th century and one very much from the 20th century, and as far as I know, she's still alive. And these are three kids who grew up without language. Uh, the boy at the top there, that's a film, but it represents a, a kid called Victor of Aveyron in France, and he was found in the forest living like an animal, uh, dirty, uh, smelly. He, did, he, ate, he only ate food that you could find in the forest, so on and so forth. He didn't have any English. Uh, I he, didn't have any, he didn't have any language. He didn't have any human language. Because as far as we know, he'd never heard it. Uh, I don't know whether he spoke tiger or something. Or, 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 but... Um, he didn't have any language. Uh, then the, the, there's a man there called Kaspar Hauser. He was a, he was a German uh, um, young man who was found in the countryside on his own with no language. Uh, uh, and um, uh, in both of their cases, um, people tried desperately to get them to have language to see if it worked. Uh, and it sort of did and it sort of didn't. They never ended up with language like you speak Spanish or I speak English or something like that. Or in some of your cases, both as good as that. Um, because you need that uh, exchange. The, and the third person who's mentioned in that text is a, a woman called uh, Jeannie Wiley, who, um, who was only discovered in the US when her mother, um, who had her with her, went to the wrong place. To, to get some money or something. And that's how they found this girl. And as far as I know, she's still alive um, um, and is a terrible mess, poor thing. It's been, it's a, now, it, as it happens in all, of these, in all of these cases, it looks like uh, the, one of the reasons, not only did they get any, not only did they not get the kind of human input that all of us got as kids, but they were also appallingly badly treated perhaps as well so maybe it's got something to it anyway the point is the point is this is a text it's a textbook test to get students to have something to talk about and read about and some language and things like that but i need your social and personal interaction with this text if it's going to mean anything what is the most important question you can ever ask someone when they've read a text what's the most important question because I can ask you a multiple choice questions. So I can ask you who did this and when did that happen and what did the man say to someone. But those questions are only a little bit important. What's the most important question? Hmm? What is it about? I want a more important question than that. Yes, I want a more important question than that. What do you want to say? What? Thank you. The really big question for you, my dear students, is what do you think of what you just read? How do you respond to what you've just read? Did you enjoy it? Why? Why not? Because if you talk about that and you've just read it in English, you, this is maybe you're my upper intermediate student, so it's quite difficult. Did you enjoy it or not? How do you respond? What's your response? And the moment you give your response to this text, it's no longer the thing that the teacher made you read. It's the thing that you personally interacted with. That's why I said at the beginning, before we start, how easy do you find it to learn languages? Why? Why not? Because it's about you. And now, your, your connection with this text, it's about you. I may do language work with it, but at the moment, it's about you. And <coughs> what we know about language, uh, what we know about language learning is it has to be about you. You can't learn a language if you aren't there. I mean, in a metaphorical sense. 
you can't learn a language if you're not there. Yeah, but but you you need to be there socially, personally, and everything else like that. I can uh, I can um, I, uh, that's just a little demonstration. But one more thing I want to say, and we'll, we'll look at some examples. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have time to get through them all, but let's have a go. <coughs> what we also know is that there are some people in the world who hear languages and learn them just like that. They just seem to <coughs> suck up languages and it's perfect. And they don't ever seem to make any effort at all. It just happens. And I'm really jealous of them. But not very jealous, because if all people were like that, we wouldn't have a job. Um, so maybe that's not such a bad thing. I didn't say that. Well, I did say that, but it was, a, it was a flippant comment. I wasn't being terribly serious. Okay, okay. Right. But what we do know is that people who actually make a bit of effort, who process the language they come across, probably learn better than people who don't process, except for the very few people who just, you know, for every good violinist, there was a Mozart who just appears to have gone, you know, but he's not a particularly good model for anybody because not everybody's like that. The most interesting question is, what about the ones who are not like that? If you work at it, something you have to work at is probably learned better than something I give you for free. If you work at it. Um, interestingly, although I've got mixed feelings about exams, some exam classes have high motivation level because students really have to work at it if they want to get the, the TOEFL or the TOEIC or the, or the Cambridge exam or something like that. Here's some examples. I'm going to tell you a story. I'll do it as quick as I can. Um, uh, this is a, a, a photograph. Uh, what can you see in the photograph? A boy band? What's noticeable about the boys? They don't just look similar. They look very, very, very similar. Any idea why that might be? What? Uh, well, they are at a film festival. Well, why do the boys look so similar? They're all brothers, six brothers. They're all six brothers, and they're dressed the same, and most of them, but not all of them, have long hair down to their waists. Recently, one or two of them had their hair cut short. Hopefully, I've got you interested. Here's a way of making a social, personal engagement work. I've got a text which tells the story of these boys. They're real boys. Well, you can see they're real boys. But I, this isn't a fake. This is true. But I'm not going to give it to you like a text. I chopped it into paragraphs. And I separate the students. Okay, this is the first thing I do. All the students see this. It says, one morning, a 15-year-old boy named Mukunda opens the door of the apartment where he lives in New York with his five brothers and one sister and walks out. He is one of the first, he is the first of his siblings to ever go outside. Mukunda, the name his father has chosen for him, means bringer of freedom. Mukunda goes down the stairs and out into the street. He walks into a bank and a grocery story, store. Story. He walks into a bank and a grocery store. He's wearing a scary mask from one of his favorite movies. Is there anything surprising in that paragraph? Are you surprised by any of that? The answer is just about everything. It's just weird. The mask, what's that all about? And what about he is the first of his siblings ever to leave and walk out? And he's 15 years old. ¿Qué está pasando? I mean, it's just, what the, what the? What, what the heck? What the heck? That's the word I was looking for. What the heck? Um, yes. So now what I do is I separate you into five groups. And each group gets a different paragraph. We're going to gallop through this, but your job in your group, imagine that you're in a group. Your job in your group is to read your paragraph, make sure you understand it. Here's one. 
Group B. One day, a young documentary filmmaker, Christophe Moselle, was walking along First Avenue in New York City. A boy in a black suit with dark glasses and waist-length hair ran past her. Then another, looking exactly the same. Then another. Six of them, ages 11 to 18. This was Crystal's neighborhood, but she'd never seen these boys before. She was intrigued and ran after them. The boys looked surprised when she talked to them. <coughs> the boys looked surprised when she talked to them. What do you do? One of them asked. I make movies, she said. The boy replied that he was a filmmaker too. Okay, so that's your group. You've got that. You must make sure you remember it. You've got all the bits and pieces. You know the story. Group C gets this. Oscar Angelo met Suzanne when he was, she was backpacking through Peru in, in 1989. They fell in love and got married. Oscar was a member of the Hare Krishna religious sect. They had seven children, six boys and a girl. They gave them Sanskrit names, Bhagavan Govinda and Nayarana, twins, Mukunda Krishna, and Jagadisa for the boys, and Vishnu for the girl. Probably because of what happened. Krishna now calls himself Glenn, and Jagadisa calls himself Eddie. Suzanne is now using her maiden name. So that's what Group C gets. You have to make sure you've got all that information. Again, it's a little bit strange. It's not, it doesn't quite make sense. It's weird. Group D gets this one. Oscar Angulo, Angulo, described by some as <coughs> work shy, believed the world was dangerous, a dangerous place that his children shouldn't have to experience. He kept them confined in their Lower East Side apartments in New York City. They hardly ever left their home. Amazingly, many of their neighbors didn't even know they existed, so quiet were they. The family's only money was from welfare checks and the money that Suzanne earned as a homeschool teacher. The boys experienced life through watching movies. They had at least 5,000 in the apartment. They would carefully reenact their favorite scenes. Their whole understanding of life was from the movies they saw and the thoughtful nurturing they received from their mother, herself also trapped by Oscar's paranoia. Group E gets another one. Police arrested Mukunda because he was scaring people with his mask but they could get not a word out of him. He wouldn't speak to anyone because his father had taught him not to talk to strangers. He was put into an ambulance and taken to the Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital <coughs> in Manhattan where he stayed for a week. I loved it, he says now, years later. It was the first time I interacted with people. After his escape, Oscar's control over his family ended and the boys started going out together to learn about the world. And the last paragraph crystal became friends with the angulo brothers for five years she filmed them and their mother gradually learning the extraordinary truth of their upbringing and watching their transformation as they learned for the first time how to interact with the world instead of just with movies and in 2015 her movie about the brothers the wolf pack won the documentary award at the sundance film festival now you're lucky because you got to read all the paragraphs one by one but in your groups, you only read one paragraph. So you're still very confused about what the heck is going on. So what I do now is I get someone from group B, one student from group C, one student from group D, one student from group E, and one student from group F. I take away their paragraphs, and I say to them, work it out. What's going on? And the only way they can work it out is by sharing what they've read and trying to make it into some kind of a narrative. Because as you could see, it's all in the wrong order. It's mixed up. And now the groups who, who make the whole story, they're actually, they're actually creating the story themselves with language that I've given them. This is not a beginner activity, obviously. It's not the point. They're creating you can do this at beginner, but obviously it would be a very different, different kind. Um, <coughs> they're creating the language with language they've had to learn because they needed it, and they're doing the processing when they talk to each other. They're using the brain power. It's their brain power. It's your brain power, not me. Yes, I'm the teacher. But I'm not working. You're working. You're working. 
processing yourself. That's magic. It really works. You can't do it all the time. And do all students love it? Well, of course they do. Like most good ideas, it's easy to talk about in a teacher's conference. Less easy to put into practice in reality. Okay. okay, so here we are. Now, here's a way to get you to process it. Close your books, everyone. Now tell me the story from memory. I'm not asking you to, don't panic. That's a really important task. You have to process. You have to really work. And then I'll say, well, she told the story. Do you agree with her? Did she leave anything out? Anybody, did she leave anything out? Yeah. And I get you to tell me what she left out. And then maybe I say, right, now I want you to tell the story in half the time. And then in half the time again. And each time you do it, your brain is working furiously. I don't mean furiously, angrily. I hope you're not angry. I mean you're working a lot. Processing without effort. I'm not standing here drilling you. I'm not standing here giving you models and grammar. You're doing all the work yourselves. It's brilliant. I love it. I love it. What about this? <coughs> okay. Are you interested in the story? Please say yes. Yes, good. Thank you. Um, so now go off onto the internet. What can you find out? Can you find out anything else about these kids, about this family? Go have a look. You're doing the work. It's your encuesta, it's not mine. I'm not saying this is, this is, this is. You're doing the work, it's you, this is you. You're the learner, I'm just the teacher. Who cares? You are the, you're the, you're right in the center. You're the focus of everything, it's up to you. And to give you an example of what I mean, uh, um, this is the one that I love best. I call this suitcase language. Takeaway language. Um, in a minute, I'm going to show you one of those paragraphs, and your um, question is, which, what three words or phrases from this paragraph would you like to put in your suitcase and take away for you? I don't care what he thinks. I, I care only what you think. And what she, the words she wants might be different from your words. But the important thing is you. I want you to be that kid who was fascinated to play a computer game. So they learned the language they needed. These are your words. So just as a quick example, quickly, and then we've got a couple more things to do. As a quick example, here's this one of these paragraphs. Can you read that? Uh, and just choose, uh, because we, we are in a hurry. We're, oh God, we're really in a hurry. Um, because we're in a hurry, just choose a word, your favorite word or phrase from that that you'd like to put in your suitcase and take away. Okay? What have you chosen? Give me, give me the word or phrase you've chosen. Which word or phrase have you chosen? To take away. Nurturing. That's not a word I teach very often. But what a lovely word to say. That's her word. She's put it in her suitcase. She's taking it away. She's not going to forget it. She won't forget that word because it belongs to her. It doesn't belong to the teacher. Another word, what did you, what, what's the word you've chosen? Paranoia, paranoia. That's a very, I'm pronouncing it very British. But paranoia. It's, again, not a word I teach that often. But now it's your word and you've got this word. I bet you, you use it sometime soon. Just to show, I can. You know, it's your word. Yes. Teacher. Teacher, that's one of the best words in the world, isn't it? That's a, teacher is a good word. Teacher is a good word. Another word, any more words? What? Welfare, 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 blah, blah, blah. welfare check, welfare check. You get the point. Now, what I will do in the next hour, oh no, I don't have another hour, do I? In fact, I really need to stop right now. Um, um, I'm just going to rush through some examples in about a minute or two, just to make my point. Um, I want you to do the processing yourself. So there is that paragraph split into sentences, or some sentences from the paragraph, but I've chopped them up. And in order for you 
to make the sentence of the story, you have to go A, B, C to make a complete sentence. <coughs> the only way you can do that is by really, really concentrating, by really processing, using your brain. You've all got fantastic brains, my dear students. Use your brain. So, for example, amazingly, A, then go to B. Amazingly, many of their neighbors didn't even know they existed. You have just now done that yourself. You've had to concentrate, work it out. The language has gone zhunk, straight into your brain. And that's you having agency and doing your planning, uh, doing, doing your, your processing. Um, uh, there we are. Right. Um, so what I could say to you very quickly is, okay, can you find any past participle in the text? Not, look at these, can you find any? And the answer is yes. Well, there's a bit of a, a discussion about whether they're past participle or something else. You get, or I could say, what past tenses, what past, what words in the past tense can you find in the text? And you have to go looking. And here they all are. Uh, and, and then I can say, right, can you make sentences using the same past tense? Give me the infinitive of it. This is all you doing the work. You're doing the work. You're doing the work. And here's one that I love. I have a friend called Adrian Underhill. Have you heard the name? He's a great expert on pronunciation teaching. I mean, classe mundial, you know. He's, he's, a, he's a very good uh, pronunciation teacher. And he says, we do pronunciation all the time. We do pronunciation all the time. Uh, uh, but you don't have to speak it. You don't have to have a special uh, pronunciation section. You just say, here is the magic little O. Here's one of the paragraphs. And I'm going to leave you with this tantalizing example. Uh, um, underline all the words which have got the letter O in them. <coughs> and you'll come up with this. There they are. <coughs> How are they pronounced? Are they all pronounced the same? And you're going to do the work. I'm going to do it for you now because, because we're finishing. But I would want you to do the work. Make lists. How many words can you find which have the same sound and different sounds? And I think you'd come up with this. Here we go. Here's one. What sound is that? One. What's the sound? Uh, uh, uh. uh very stretch. Uh, not stretched. Round it. Uh, uh. There you are. And that's the sound. That's that. And we've got we've got two words. We've got one and brothers. Same sound. Brothers. One. Uh. One. What about this one? Morning. What's that sound? What's the sound? What's the sound? Or. 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 How many words have we got in the text for that? And of course, you would have identified because you're doing the work. You would have identified. These words, that's the, the symbol, and it's York door for store. It's just a little, little paragraph, but it's so rich for you to do all this processing, all this work. What about um, old? What's that sound? What's, this, what's the old sound? Say it. Give me the sound. Oh, 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 oh. So we've got old, and we've also got open, go, chosen, grocery. Uh, what about this sound? Two, two. Now, sometimes two is t, t. But in this case, it's two, I'm telling you. What's the sound? What's the sound? What's the sound of O in two? What's the sound? Ooh, ooh, that's right. Ooh, ooh, the monkey sound. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 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 And there we are. So we've got movies. Two movies. Uh, this is outside. What's the sound of outside? What's the sound? Ow. 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 Outside. Do we have any others? Yeah, we've got down and out. Uh, and then we've got freedom. What's that sound? Freedom. What's the sound there? 
It's the famous, it's our friend the schwa, which the British like a lot more than the Americans do. But I like it because I'm British, so that. That's the schwa. And we've got, uh, and then we've finally got horror. What's that sound? Oh, 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 oh. And we've got of, horror and of. You get the idea. All of this is me saying to you, uh, I can get you to do all the processing. I can get you to be in control. Now, admittedly, I've got some tasks for you, but I can teach you these sounds. That's not actually what, what's, that's not what's going on. I'm making, getting you to hear the sounds in your head, in your ear, while you're reading. I'm getting you to do the work getting you to be in charge. So, we start, we didn't start, but we said, oh, there, oh forgot about oi, are there any oi, uh, were there any oi words? And of course, what's a typical word for oi? Oi. Boy. And there's one boy in that text. Oi, oi, oi. Um, right, there we go. Do I know how to teach English? Uh, not really. I've got lots of ideas. I've spent my life writing about it, training teachers, trying to find best practice. But there's nothing that works 100% of the time. Nothing. What we do is we do the best we can. And we acknowledge that, uh, go away, we acknowledge that one size doesn't fit all. So our job is to find the, 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 the punto clave, the, 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 the no, the clave para abrir la puerta. Well, I can't even speak. We need the key. We need to find. We need to find the key which will unlock you. And it may not be the same key that unlocks you. So the one thing I know is I'm not always going to do it. So it's for her. I've got to try and do some things which might be for her. And my job is to, if we think about agency, social and personal processing. If we if we think about the things, if we think about creating situations which make most of the students want to do, want to get the English I'm going to tell them about, we've got a chance. We've got a chance. Oh, by the way, I'm I'm, I'm not a pessimist. Well, I am, but but that's that. I talked to my analyst about that. I don't have an analyst. I should have an analyst. Have you got an, anyone here got an analyst? Does it work? Yeah, some people love an analysts. I don't have. Anyway, I, I'm a bit of a pessimist, but I'm not a pessimist about language teaching because what I see in this room, especially the more experienced people, is really successful teachers who are fantastic. And somehow they've found those claves to unlock students. And that's what we've been talking about. Listen, um, I'm, I am now in a state of complete happiness, uh, a complete ecstasy. Well, that's a, no, this doesn't look like it. I'm very happy because I've done my job, I've done my work, and I can now relax. I went to some lovely talks this morning. There are more talks to go to. There are more people to talk to, more photographs to take, more lots of things. But that's what I wanted to say about the enigma of language. You've been very kind to listen to me. I'm sorry I went on a little bit too long. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Jeremy. Thank you for your talk, and you are really an inspiring teaching for all of us. Here is a small present for oh, you. Sure. Oh, and you. there is another girl who has a present for you. Here she is. She also has a present for you. Oh, my word. Oh, uh, hi. How are you? I, nice I, to meet you. I'm happy now. I, I'm happy now, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give you a present. Um, sorry, I, I'm nervous. No, estoy en las pantallas, ¿verdad? Ah, bueno. <laughs> Este, ah, well, do you speak Spanish, right? Yeah, I will intend to. Okay, well, I'm going to speak Spanish. So, uh, do you know the Dr. Simi? Okay. Do you know the Dr. Simi or not? Okay. Dr. Simi? No, 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 no,
Okay, uh, here is a pharmacy that it's called Timmy, <laughs> Timmy Laris. And the pet, it's a doctor, right? So uh, here is a tradition that we admire, we, <laughs> wait. I mean, I say, we give to uh, Simi, someone that we admire. So I admire you, to you. So here is my gift for you. Oh, hey, look at that. Oh. <laughs> hey, congratulations. Thank you for my gift. Thank uh, you, thank you. I'm so uh, happy. It's dressed like a teacher, and here have a sweet kiss with your name. You yes. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. A, applause for her. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. On behalf of all the faculty of languages, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, get on with yourselves. Go, go away. <laughs> uh, un pequeño.